Um, we started a series last week entitled Real Faith for the Real World. This is out of the book of James. Real Faith for the Real World. And I could have just as easily maybe turned that around and said that because we live in a real world, we need a real faith. Not just a Sunday faith or a church faith. I mean, no, it's easy to have faith in church. But a faith that works outside the walls of the church, a Monday faith, Tuesday faith, Wednesday faith, that kind of faith that says, I'm not just a person of faith and, and have belief, but the kind of faith that will get you through the crisis or get you through life's storms. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The book of Romans says that we walk by faith. Walking is something that we do every day. And so Romans is telling us that this is a lifestyle. It says the just shall live by faith. So this is a 24-7 venture, something that we do and walk out every day. As I said last week, the book of James is, is both a practical and tactical book. There's a lot of practicality. It's not all the uh, up here type of theology. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's wisdom of things that we need to do. And so we spent a lot of time last week primarily talking about joy, the value of joy, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the need to have joy in your life and how important that it is. And we pointed out that every one of us here have on the inside of us a joy tank, just like your car has a fuel tank. And on that fuel tank, there's a needle that is an indicator. And what that indicator does is that it tells you how much further you can go. It tells you how much reserve that you have. And it's a gauge. Well, joy is the same thing. Joy tells you how much further you can go. Joy tells you how much reserve that you have. And when we know that we need to refill or refuel that tank. In fact, Jesus said this. Jesus said that I have come that you might have joy and have it to its fullest. And so this is something that heaven wants us to have because we pointed out the value of joy. That God wants us to be joyful and Satan wants to steal our joy. So there's something about joy that is important to the economy of heaven. God wants us to have it in our life. And so talking about that needle illustration, I thought about this. How do I know? Well, when you begin to complain more than you praise, it's time to refuel and rejoice. Let me know what I'm talking about. When you begin to get easily upset and things begin to rock your boat that shouldn't rock your boat, it's time to refuel and to rejoice in your life. When you look at life and you begin to see the negative before you see the positive, then that's a pretty good indicator that you need to refuel and rejoice because you're running on fumes, joy-wise, so to speak. And if you're impatient or if you're critical, those are gauges, those are signs that we need to do something about where we are. And so let me give you four things this morning that I couldn't fit into the message last week, didn't get into there concerning joy. Four things concerning joy. One is this, is that Jesus expects us to face every storm, every crisis with joy. Jesus said basically that the storms of life are to be faced with joy. Every difficult situation is to be faced with joy in your life. I think it's important if Jesus uh, gave us that advice, it's important that we understand that. I've got a pastor friend that was talking about joy and here's what he said. He said, joy is like the playroom in the pediatrician's office. That even though babies are coming in there, toddlers are coming in there and they're not feeling well and they're battling something and they've got fevers, they still are gathered to that play area and they play and they, uh, they're having fun in spite of what they're going through. And he said, that's what joy is like. Even though you may be going through a storm, you may be facing difficult times, we still need to enjoy the life that we have and let joy, God's joy, fill our lives. It's so important. Second thing is that you need to make the choice to rejoice. It is a choice. Being joyful doesn't just happen. It doesn't just fall on you. 
but you make the choice, I'm going to live this lifestyle. I'm going to rejoice in the things to come and the things that show up in my life. And the thing that I found out, when you choose joy, that means you choose to have joy over every negative thought and emotion. And that means that you are probably going to get to choose joy hundreds of times a day. Because we are bombarded with all of these negative thoughts and emotions. And every time that negative thought comes, every time that negative emotion comes, you need to choose joy over that negativity. The third thing that that I would say is this, is that if you want greater joy, then you're going to have to spend more time with God. I mean, that is just cut and dry. That is as simple as I know how to make it. If you want greater joy, spend more time with God because the Bible says that in his presence is the fullness of joy. You're not going to find joy apart from God. You're not going to find joy outside of a relationship with God because he's the source of joy. And the last thing that I would say about joy is this, is that if you want joy in your life, then you are going to have to remove the toxins out of your life. Now, again, a toxin is not one of those things that you just show up and all of a sudden you realize you're in trouble, but very gradually and very slowly, it begins to take over your life. See, toxins begin to build up over a period of time. And as they do, they begin to rob you of your health and of your strength and will eventually kill you. And there are a lot of negative things in life that you need to get rid of. There are some negative relationships that you need to say, man, these relationships are not healthy for me. There are some negative things that you need to get out of your vocabulary. There are some negative words that you need to just cut out of your life. So there are all of these negative things that show up that need to be removed. It may even be media, the things that we watch or listen to, but joy comes. I, 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 I told, the, I told the, the first service that, that I, I'm happy now that I've cut a lot of the news out of my life. Whether it's fake news, real news, or any other type of news. It's, you know what? I'm just better off without it. There are certain things you need to just cut out of your life. So today, I want to talk about actions speak louder. If you have your Bible or your device, go to James chapter 2. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. Actions speak louder. Father, thank you this morning that your word instructs and directs and gives us uh, insight for our lives. And Father, we are ready to receive Jesus. Father, when we are ready to receive the word, We are ready to receive Jesus because he is the word of God. And so, Jesus, we just take these few moments to build that relationship with you, to let your word speak to us. And, Father, we thank you that you do and will speak in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have heard the saying, since this message is actions speak louder, how many of you have heard the sayings that your actions are speaking so loud I can't hear what you're saying. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What we do oftentimes communicates so much louder than what we say. And so think about that as we, as we read these few verses. James chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse 1. And it says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and to the poor man, you stand over there or, or sit, sit at the footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So let's stop right there as we work our way through this chapter One of the first things that James tells us, and again, the book of James is to the New Testament what Proverbs is to the Old Testament. Proverbs is the wisdom book of the Old Testament. It's the practical, common sense book of the Old Testament. James is that to the New Testament. And the first thing that he points out is, hey, listen, here's what he's saying. God's message to our hearts this morning is treat everybody with respect. How many think that's a good message this morning, right? Just treat everybody equal. God says, I want you to love people no matter what. 
no matter where they've come from, no matter what they've been through, no matter what you've heard. He said, I just want you to love people. How many of you here have, have ever heard of what the Bible calls the golden rule? Anybody? Anybody remember the golden rule, right? At Matthew chapter 7, I think it's verse 12. And here's what the golden rule says. It says that we are to treat others the same way that we want to be treated. And when I think about that verse and I, I, I meditate on that, the only thought I can have is, wow. I mean, just wow. How would that change life if we started to put that into effect in our lives, that we just begin to treat other people the same way that we want to be treated? And it is a life-changing moment that we can do that. And yet that comes from the very heart of God. What a great way to change your family. Begin to treat your family the same way that you want to be treated. And so James is telling us in the first couple of verses there is that we're not to judge people. We're not to judge a person by the way that they dress. We're not to judge a person by what they drive or, or where they live. And because the point that he's saying, especially in church, is this, is that it doesn't matter whatever your station is outside of the church, whatever your title is, whatever your income is, all that stuff doesn't matter. That stays outside of the church because when we come in here, we're all equal. When we come in here, it's not about us and it's not about status. When we come in here, it's about Christ. And lifting him up and pointing people to Jesus and letting him be glorified in this place. And so we come in and we understand that. I love this saying. It says that your net worth doesn't determine your self-worth. How much stuff you have doesn't mean anything to God. How much stuff you have doesn't change the effects of eternity. So the best thing that I can say and what the Bible is saying is just leave people alone. Listen, if it's none of your business, leave it alone. Just let people live their lives, amen? In fact, tell your neighbor this morning, cut me some grace. Come on, that's good advice. Just cut me some grace. First Samuel chapter 6, here's what David said, or said in this book, is that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. It says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. How many know God is interested in who you are, not what you are? As I was writing notes this week for this message, I, I thought about this, that there, there are two things in life that we need to give away freely. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not going to cost you a dime. But there's two things in life that we need to give away Freely. Let me tell you what those are this morning. Number one is mercy. We need to be willing to be merciful to people in our lives. Doesn't cost you anything to, to, to help people to succeed in life and to show mercy to them. Always be quick to show mercy. Why? Because there will come a time that you need mercy in your life. And you want to make sure that you've got a lot of seed that's been planted out there. You want to make sure that, that you have a huge harvest of mercy coming back to you when it's your turn in life that you need mercy in your life. Psalms 23, David said this. He said, surely, at the end of that psalm, he said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Here's what goodness is. Goodness gives me what I don't deserve. Mercy spares me from what I do deserve. And David said, I want to have goodness and mercy all the days of my life. And when he put that phrase in there, all the days of my life, he's simply saying what God says is that God's mercy is not going to wear out or wear off or wear down, but he's going to be with you all the days of your life. And so if God has been merciful to you, he's just simply saying, go ahead and pay it forward. If God's been good to you, you can afford to be good to other people. The second thing that I would say, one, that we need to give mercy every day. Number two, we need to give honor every day. That's a great word. The Bible word honor means this. It means to add value to or to assign worth. And this is a huge principle 
in God's word. When I honor someone, I'm going to assign, I'm going to add value to them or to assign worth. And here's the reason it's so important. It is because that God honors those who honor others. All right, let's just get real and and where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Listen, if you want a better marriage, husbands, begin to honor your wife. Ladies, you need to get your husbands to base camp because this is one of the things we talked about last week. As husbands, we need to learn to honor our wives. And the moment you begin to do that, it begins to make a transition in your marriage relationship. And that's one of the reasons God said, wives, honor your husbands, which means to respect your husbands in that situation. Here's a challenge for you. And the reason I say this a challenge is because it may take some effort. If you've got a difficult boss, rather than going the way the world goes, and that is complaining, that is criticizing, that is, uh, you know, venting. If you've got a bad boss in a bad situation, I challenge you to begin to honor that boss. Because that's the Bible principle. If you've got a difficult situation or a person in your life, begin to honor them and see what God is going to do in their life. See what difference it's going to make. A number of years ago, in fact, let's be honest, a lot of years ago, I was an associate at a church. And uh, I resigned my position at this church. I was a young man, single, and resigned my position as an associate at this church because the pastor and I saw things differently. Not heaven or hell issues or immoral or anything like that, but it was just, it was just something that, that I could no longer go that, that way. So I offered my resignation. And after I gave my resignation, the board came to me and they wanted to meet with me. And so I sat down with the board, met with these men and their wives. And, and, and in this conversation, they begin, they begin to talk negatively about the pastor. Now, I'm a, I'm a young man. I don't know much, okay? And I, I'm in this room with these, these older men and women and very respected in the community. But I knew this. I knew that I could not sit there in that conversation. And so as humbly as I could, I stood up and I said, guys, listen, here's the deal. I cannot be a part of this because that's the pastor and I'm going to honor him no matter what. I'm not important. This is not my church. This is his church and he makes the calls. And so I can't be a part of this meeting. I love you, but I'm leaving. That was so I was terrified to make that statement. I was scared to do that. But there was no way I was not going to honor the pastor in that situation. And even, even when I was thinking about this today, I, I, the other day as I was writing this, I thought, God, I really want to be careful because even though this pastor has been dead a number of years, I don't want to say anything that would cast any doubt on him. But I remember shortly after that, when I left, man, I got, I, I got no pension. I got, no, I got nothing. I just left and that was it. I'm on my own. Now, I remember a couple of weeks after I'd been gone, the pastor came and he knocked on the door of my apartment. He had tears in his eyes and he handed me a check and he said, I just want to thank you for paying honor to me. Can I just tell you that meant the world to me? See, begin to honor people, even if it's a difficult situation, because God honors those who honors others. It's God's way. Rich Wilkerson, in his book, I Choose Honor, said this. He said, honor is kissing up. Now, when I say kissing up, it's not kissing up the way we think about it, where I'm going to manipulate someone or I'm going to kiss up to them and I'm going to get, I'm going to play the politics of the office or whatever I need to do. Kissing up means to kiss the hand and to show respect. And so what he's saying is that when I honor someone, I am honoring God and I'm kissing the hand of God. I'm doing this for God. God, I'm honoring you by honoring this person and following your plan because again, God honors those who honor others. Jump down to verse 14 if you still have your Bible open. And he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of, one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you don't give them things that they need for their body, 
What good is it? What good is your faith? What good is that faith? Your faith also by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. So he's talking about here that, that it's not the work. In other words, is faith with works or is faith without works? What do we do here? One of the things that I found out that in Christianity, basically there are two extremes when it comes to believers. One is what I call the plastic bubble believer because these are the believers that live their lives in a plastic bubble and everything to them is praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, amen. And they're just really not real. They're kind of fake. They kind of live in this plastic church bubble separated from the real world. The other extreme is what I call the camo Christian. And these are the ones that so blend into the world that you can't even tell the difference between them and the world. And because Jesus said, listen, you are in the world, but you're not of the world. Come out from those that are in the world. Come out and be separate from them. So when he's talking about works here, it's not the good works that I do to get God to love me. God, I'm going to work really hard in the church, and I'm going to pay my tithes, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray. And because I'm doing all these good things, you're going to smile on me, and you're going to love me. It doesn't work that way. God already loves you. It's not by what you do. It's what he's done. So those aren't the works that it's talking about. The works that he's talking about are the works that I demonstrate. Because he loves me, I'm going to demonstrate the love of God. Because he loves me, I'm going to do things to help other people. Because he loves me, I do all of those things because he loves me, not in order to get him to love me. Faith by itself Without works, he's saying, is dead. Our good works give glory to God. Look at verse 19. In fact, let me go back and read verse 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So what he's saying here is this, that faith without works is a dead faith. See, my works, my, my faith, and the works, the, the actions of my life should back up what I'm believing. And I'll give you a classic example. I think this is a great example. Is that when a young couple, a husband and wife, find out that they're gonna have a baby, they immediately go into a mode of preparation. And they begin to pick out names and they begin to design a nursery and they begin to let people know something's getting ready to happen in my life. You know what that is? That's good works. That is a faith that's so strong. In other words, they don't wait for the baby to show up in their life and they say, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do with this? I guess we really were pregnant. They begin the moment to make preparations for what's going to happen for the blessing that's coming. That's when I have faith with works. When I, when I believe that God's going to do something and I begin to make preparation and I begin to say that my life's going to look like this, things are going to be different, then I've got works with, with my faith to go along with it. And I'll give you an example. Second Kings chapter 4. And this is the story of Elisha and Gehazi and a particular woman. In fact, let me go ahead and read a few of these verses, and I'll give you the background behind it. Uh, In in, um, 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, he tells this lady that that he he had met. He says, then he said, about this time, Elisha is saying to her, you next year, you shall embrace the son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son at the appointed time of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. So the story is this. There was a lady that wanted to have a child but couldn't. But when Elisha would come by her house, Elisha was the prophet. She, was, she so loved the prophet that she built a room on the top of her house for, so that when Elisha came, he could stay in that room. Now, remember, Elisha is a type of the word of God. He came bringing the word. He came bringing instructions from God to her life. And she had hospitality towards him. Listen, when we open our hearts to the word of God, 
When we open our life and just say, man, God, I invite your word in. Whatever your word says, that's what I want. And I, I love the word. How many know we need to become lovers of the word of God? And we need to embrace the word of God. And that's what she did. She made room for the word of God in her life. She made room for the prophet. And then one day, God said, ask her what she wants. And she wanted a child. And so he said, you're going to have a child. See, God answers her prayer. So a year later, she has a child, and the story fast forwards, and now this child is, 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 a, is a young man, he's younger, and he's going out into the field to where his dad is, and what happens, most theologians and most uh, commentaries say is that he was out in the hot sun, that he had a heat stroke or some sort of stroke, and he died. The mother holds him on his lap, and he dies while, while she's out there uh, trying to, to nurse him, so to speak. Look at verse 24. So she said, she said, she said, she said it, then suddenly a donkey, she said, then saddle a donkey. And she said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off. She's got her dead son with her. When he saw her afar off, said to his servant, Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, Please now run to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Let me just answer for her. It's not well with her. It's not well with her husband. And her child is dead. But what does she say? She says, it is well. Now, here's a picture of works with faith. She was prophesying her future. She was talking about what she wanted God to do. And even though it wasn't well, her son was dead. The promise from God had died. She came to the prophet and she said, he said, is everything all right? She said, it's going to be all right. I'm just telling you ahead of time, God's going to work this out. God's got this. God's going to figure this out. And she trusted God in that difficult situation. It is well. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that your faith should be growing exceedingly. Our actions should speak louder than our words. Your faith should be growing exceedingly. There are four stages of faith, four levels of faith. One is negative faith. That's what we call fear. That I can't even get in faith. All, I look at my life and all I see are the bad things and all the possibilities of bad things that could happen. And then there's no faith. I, I have faith. I'm just not going to walk in faith. I'm just not going to use my faith. I'm not fearful, but I just don't believe God can do anything. Then there is little faith that the Bible talks about. And little faith is in the sense of endurance, that I can have faith, I just can't have faith long enough to get me through the storm. I have little faith, I have faith, but it's not a faith that will endure and see me all the way through. And then the last faith that the Bible talks about is great faith. And there are two times in instances in the Word of God when Jesus looked at a situation and he said, never have I seen such great faith. And both times, it was when someone just said, God, you've got this, and I trust you. 